and um, basically we've got a, a I guess the, the background is that, that anybody that's looked at the ACPI spec and tried to match it to um, based systems today would have found a number of areas that um, that ACPI doesn't really talk to that you need to be able to do generic idle management. It's exactly, to be honest, the same problems and the same bits of data that you want to represent in an FTT based system. It's not just ACPI. So a lot of talk that a lot of what we're talking about today is how to fit it into ACPI. Some of those concepts will map across. Um, and uh, so this is a scenario that in we started looking at. Uh, in conjunction with Linaro and with a whole host of other companies, there's an ACPI uh, forum group. You guys probably heard Don Wei's announcement on Monday that you know ACPI is now going under UEFI and it's going to be much more open, much more, be a lot more companies contributing to that. And um, but you know this is one of the key areas that we want to try and sort out. People are, are, are you know getting you know some people have already got hardware and people is you know, hardware is, is, is on its way. And to solve these problems, we're going to have to get alignment of, you know, any spec changes that we need, any code changes in the kernel that we need, uh, and any um, changes for the ACPI tools themselves to be able to build the new representations. So I'm just going to go through a whole host of problems and a, a set of proposals. And really, what would be good would be to get your feedback. You know, other problems that are not being covered. Um, do the proposals make sense? Do you have better counter proposals? Uh, and the idea is that then we collect all of this and we present it in the ACPI forum, and everybody get, creates a great spec for power state management in R. So I guess there's a few areas. One of them is the just language in the spec. Uh, this is, and I call this a numerical non-equivalency problem, but that's just simply that the in, in the ARM space, uh, we've taken the ACPI nomenclature because ACPI was being used by Linux. So everybody uses handles like C state, P state, etc. But they use it willy nilly um, in whatever fits their SOC. And, and you know, even, even SOCs from the same vendor might not necessarily always align. But ironically, the ACPI spec does actually try to define, <laughs> let's use my words carefully, <laughs> it tries try to define. Uh, States uh, and state types, you know. So it, talk, it has strong ish definitions around C1, C2, and C3. Um, so when you look at uh, states for ARM, uh, really they just come in four sorts of categories that we care about. Uh, running, uh, that would always map to Z0, and everybody would map that, that's fine. Uh, Idle, which is when you're clock gated effectively, but you might have magic hardware retention. That means that uh, it's more than being clock gated. But what I mean is clock gated as far as the OS is concerned. It, it, it'll resume from the next line after the WFI. Uh, it doesn't have to say restore context. It, it just looks like the world is still here. I can carry on computing uh, as soon as I receive an interrupt. And uh, sleep is basically uh, something that you don't have in the x86 world, which is I need to save all of my context uh, in software, uh, put it away, because when I come back, I'm going to come back by the reset vector, at which point I'll restore all of my context. Um, and that, that's, I mean, that's actually one particular one big hole for ACPI, because ACPI just hasn't had to deal with that problem before. But ironically, something that we can actually code in a, in a generic way, so um, it, it makes sense to represent that in the spec. And really, the proposal is that if you go and read the spec, uh, it's interesting to be, have a show of hands of how many people have read C1, C2, and C3 in the spec. But, um, but hey, <laughs> just feel <laughs> us. <laughs> C2 is pointless. Uh, and that's, that's my point, really. So what if you would have more than one idle state? Types of state. No, no, no. No, no, no. These are types of state. I want to be very clear on that. So um, you can have multiple of each type. Right? This is just basically to say a state of this type has these core semantics. Core semantics are I don't have to save and restore context in the C1 example, because the hardware is either going to do that for me, or it's just a clock gated state and there's no need anyway. Right? And C3, the reason why I pick C3 and not C2 is because the spec Basically, more or less describes C1, C2, and C, well, C1 and C3 in very similar terms to this. You know, C3, for example, requires cache management, right? Um, 
but C2 is described as a basically, well, it's like C1 but deeper. But it's still also described as a type of state. So uh, to me, that's just not a particularly strong definition. I, I can't understand when you'd use a C1 and when you'd use a C2. But it, of course, when, they, when the spec started, those were actually states. They weren't types of state. So that's why they had three. But then, you know, Intel came out with cores that had more states. Oh, maybe it was AMD actually. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, and then they went, oh shit, you know, we actually we, we need more than this. So then they said, well, but the semantics are more or less the same. So we'll make them types, right? So the proposal that I want to do is C1 is kind of one of those. It's a hybrid. It's, it's a type, but it's also a state. So WFI is a C1. And everybody should just, WFI is C1, right? I don't like, you know, so if, if a system tells me it's doing C1, I know it's in one of these types of state, and most likely it's just WFI. So WFI is a type of No, no, but I go back to the semantics, right? It's a type of state, right? It's just that um, probably the first state that, you, that you're that always ever going to describe is the very basic WFI. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then C3 would be one where, or states of type C3, to be careful with my language, would be would be ones that have these. So, I mean, that's basically that, the proposal there. The proposal is to simply that we go and change the spec in those definitions and just say, on an ARM system, that's what this means. That's what this means. So, um, how would a core going to sleep or context case be safely restored in, in hardware where other cache, where it shares caches and the cache higher? I'm, I'm going to come to that. Yeah. We've got th this is the simplest bit. Oh. This is just can we just change a few lines? Uh, I'm not seeing a lot of dissension, so it's okay with that. Topology. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to start just with power state topology caching. I've got at the end as well. It's just it's a whole other area of topology, but topology in general is the biggest problem, right? Um, so ACPI has. Um, to, to express, it, it can express dependencies between states, which is a way of expressing topology. It's a way of saying uh, this particular state requires this and this CPU to, to go into the state together before I can use it, um, which is kind of topology. You could say that's a cluster state, for example. Um, but it also relies on the notion of of, um, of indexing and um, the states essentially being the same at each index level, if you like. So, you know, your CPU, you, you, all, all effectively, really, it's an assumption of symmetry. All the CPUs have the same states. So you declare the same states for all the CPUs, and therefore you expect, and when you de just use this CSD object to describe the dependencies, you're saying state at index 3 is a dependency state, and these CPUs are in it. It's essentially what, it, what it's saying. But that means that state at index 3 has to be the same state. Well, all the CPUs that are participating in that dependency. And, you know, if you went to really horrible heterogeneous systems, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. Uh, also, you know, when you look at uh, Linux, it doesn't use it. Uh, feedback from other OSBs, and I'm not going to give you any prizes for guessing, um, is that it's actually quite a complex uh, way of doing it, not particularly easy for the kernel to manage it. They don't particularly like it. Um, and actually, that's part of the reason why we haven't, I guess, done it in Linux, is because in x86, you don't really have to care about this. But in ARM, we really do. So this is uh, the kind of proposal <coughs> that I've got a horribly complicated computer here with Acme calls. It's, it's all by, uh, by Coyote to chase Roadrunner. And uh, it's got different numbers of states at each call. So, you know, my Acme X has idle retention 1 and sleep. Uh, the cluster's got sleep. The system level's got sleep. But my Acme 1 hasn't got retention 1, for example, or my Acme Y. My Acme Z has got retention 1 and retention 2. So they all have different numbers of states, right? Um, if you try to represent this with a CST, you just can't, period. It, it just can't, can't do it. Um, you could do it if you do really weird things like allowing negative indexing, for example. There's an index of minus one would be the system level sleep because it's the last state for everybody and so on. So you can do kind of, but people are already complaining that CSD is a pain in the ass to work with. Add negative indexing on top. Doesn't, doesn't seem to make sense to me. But 
the one thing that's actually quite nice about uh, ASL is that it's already got uh, a concept of hierarchy in in the way it describes things, right? And actually, it's got uh, modules, um, which are things that can contain other devices or other modules. So you can represent whole arbitrary hierarchies with this. Um, for processors individually, it's got uh, an object called CST, which describes the states, describes all of the states that are visible to that processor. Um, my suggestion is that we have, um, actually, I've put CST here, but for other reasons, it'd be something a bit more complicated, but we'll go on to next. But the idea would be that you have an object of this kind at each level of the hierarchy. So if I want to describe um, the system at the outer level, yeah, at the outer level, I uh, describe a module for the system. This is ACPI pseudocode. It's not really ACPI code, ML. And the power state that I describe at that level is system sleep. So that's a, basically a couple state that requires everybody within this level of the hierarchy to participate. At cluster level zero, I would describe its power state, which is a sleep cluster. And then within that module, I would describe the processes and the processor power states. So CPU zero would be this one, and it's got idle retention one and sleep. CPU one has got just idle and sleep, etc. So this coupled state here, the cluster sleep state for cluster zero, requires processor zero and processor one to participate in that. So then when the kernel is trying to pick up what power states are visible from each processor, it would start at the leaves of this tree, work its way up, and say, right, these are all the power states. And this is how they're coupled, because it's implicit in the hierarchy. There's no need for CSDs and funny indexing and trying to come up with, well, the way CSD works, which is a little bit horrendous. And, and you get your hierarchy. I'll come into cache in a minute, but you might Association already see. Association by inclusion. Sorry? Association by inclusion. Yeah, exactly. It's already, you know, topologies are hierarchical. The language is hierarchical, can describe hierarchies. Why not use it? You know, so that's 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 kind of the proposal for that. Will it allow more layering and more? Uh, as far as the ASL definition goes, uh, in the spec, I couldn't see any specific limit to it. We've tried to do modules of processes and just try and compile it and see what happens, and it worked. Um, I haven't tried a module of a module of a module yet. It, it, but, it should work. But it should work. There's no reason why, you know. There's no limitation that you're aware of. No, not. Are you, Dong, are you? Yeah, work? it should work. Yeah. Right. So that's the. Everybody seems okay with that. We might get out of here quite quickly. There's <laughs> such luck. Uh, okay. Uh, so, 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 more contentious. Um, so just just a, a brief question. So how would this work in a in a hot plug? I mean, have you thought about that? Too? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> leading to my answer. Uh, What's the, question? the question. Sorry, the question is uh, how would this work in hot plug? So actually, as far as I can see in ACPI, there's, well, there's two, there's two kind of hot plugs we've got to worry about. One is um, the kind of mobile style hot plug where the CPU mm. was always there. The thing has been described from the beginning. It's just like totally us. I'm not using it for a while. And we'll come back. The description is permanently there. Right. Um, okay. So, you know, that's fine. Uh, essentially, you know, and that's where interfaces like PSCI would track last man for you and all of that. It, it, it should just work. Um, the more interesting one, though, which I don't quite know how it works and actually Maybe some of the more there's, there's are people that have a lot more experience in this than me, and I'm just trying to figure it out. But they might have ideas. Is how do you inject new right, stuff, right? right. Um, but obviously, describing it in ASL, I know it gives you the opportunity to inject stuff, but I have no idea what the mechanics of the injection actually are. So you know, the, the use case would be: I have a system that you know I booted with with 128 cores, and then one day I decide that I'm going to add another another 64 cores to it, and the ASL needs to be extended to describe exactly. those. So, one, one of the ways you can do it is somebody, um, oh, so so pull in a sec, an, another table at that point with the with the new descriptions. 
actually we view the same table because the load table command allows you to, to reload uh, add a parameter. The load table allows you to provide a little bit of dynamic editing into mm -hmm. the with the table that gets loaded. So you can use the same SSDT and you give it a number so that all of the subordinate ASL code can then go, oh, I'm actually module number three that was plugged in. Right. And so right. all the number all the relevant numbering gets updated with that. Do you like stop the OS at that point? What, what, how does that work? Sorry, I didn't hear the question. Uh, you know, I, I'm just curious what happens at, at an OS level when you suddenly injected a whole load of calls and how does you know? Would presumably have to then reevaluate the tables and reevaluate the view of the world, etc. So, presumably, you just have like a general full-on stop. Load the tables. And the OS goes and reevaluates. Or how, how does that work? Curious. The kernel only has to reevaluate the table that's new in this case. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, it still has to do a lot of stuff because there might be 120 new processors to add into its internal right, stuff. Right, right. But if, but it's still a subset, a subtree of the, of, of the existing tree, and it's right. just an addition. Can't you can't overwrite the previous tree? Right. Okay. You have to unload the previous tree if you want to do that. Okay. Okay. I mean, I guess if you had if you had you know if if you had states that were at the outermost layer of your tree, then that would be the case. Like you would have to do that. Yeah, we can share this. over here. Just throw it, Grant. Um, I'm, I'm no wise on uh, the CPI, but is this a new proposal or has this been existing? This is a new proposal. So uh, I um, think maybe we should give a bit of background on that. Quick, uh, quick question, like how do you capture which of the CST states, you know, maps to the system sleep, for example, in, the, in, oh, the, in this the, example? The, like. the idea is that at, at every level, you're only defining the states that are private to that level. So the and, and it, so every level has its own state description. Where's my map? There it is. So at the module, at the system level, which you know, represents the outer layer of the onion here, I just described this state. At the cluster level, this one, I'm just describing its state. At the CPU level, I'm just describing <coughs> states that are private to that CPU. But let's <coughs> say in, in, in the system, until it goes to the deepest possible state in the cluster, until then, the system can't enter the sleep. Right. This dependency, where is this captured? I mean, I, well, I don't, oops. I don't. So, oh. yeah. sorry. Um, so, so in the ACPI driver itself, it, the way this would work is that it actually looks through the tree, and it's just keeping track of who's in what state, right? So, as as it traverses the tree, it knows all of these things below me are now quiet. I can now enter this state. Yeah, actually, if I, so the, the semantics actually would be that the, a processor can ask for any of the states that is that is right. from from its from its leaf up the chain. So, for example, if this CPU asked for a cluster cluster sleep, okay, right? Okay. When this second CPU asks for cluster sleep, we'll get cluster sleep. So he's not just asking for idle retention one or sleep, but he exactly. could be asking for. He would be asking. So, oh, so, so, so the kernel would reconstruct the states visible from that CPU outward. Yeah. 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 So, so that would feed into the uh, power management state machine that would decide right. what to actually do. Yeah. I remember seeing a slide you had that had the little blocks here, like the common states between the CPUs and how they, when this one reached that and this one. Oh, uh, not on this deck. Okay. Not on this deck, but yeah, but that would have been a good way of doing it. Yeah, right. you're right. Yeah, sorry. I, I had all these slides and then I got told, no, no, you can't do slides here. You know? So, you know, <laughs> blame, blame him. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, couldn't resist. Um, how, how then do you capture the, uh, the associated costs as you go through? Is that something you're getting to? Uh, I've got, actually, no, that's a really good question. So well, I've, got, I've got a notion of cost, uh, and I've also got the cash. The cash is quite, once you've got this, cash is a little bit simpler, I think. But uh, the notion of cost is a really interesting one, and I've got a very naughty way of doing it. 
<laughs> slightly less naughty on that what's in the CPI today. Um, and I'd be interested. So, so why don't we do that? Some of some of that now. Well, and, and while he's looking for that that slide, uh, just a little background. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the, the stuff that Charles is describing is a very dynamic behavior, right? So you're going to evaluate those things at, at runtime. Um, there has to be a corresponding set of tables that are static tables at, at startup. Um, so between the two of us and actually several other people, we're, we're trying to get all of these to sort of make some sort of sense together. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we've done in the static tables, we've got some ideas on how to capture cash levels and costs as, as, as well as what Charles has done in the oh, ASL. Okay. Um, so, so that we can do that and actually make an intelligent decision at that point. So, what is the static table? What computing is on your farm? Um, it's, it's, it's because of, of when you do the initialization in ACPI. So, you, you need some, some, some basic static information at the very beginning, and then later on you can, you can add stuff once I get um, VM set so up. I, I think this is mainly for getting the scheduler to sort itself right. out from early on. Uh, Scheduler also needs topology information, so this is just so it's instantly initialized. Mm -hmm. It's not for driving uh, CPU idle. Right. You know, we we can we can live with the two or three milliseconds that it will take before you know, the ACPI ML interpreter is just kicked up and up and going, whatever it will be. Yeah. Okay, it might be a little bit longer, but you, you get my point. Uh, okay, yeah, costs. So um, actually. Maybe there should be less slides. Um, so that the, okay, mm -hmm. the, uh, at, at each kind of level of of, of the tree, uh, in the proposed idea, we, we would have a effectively an array of uh, of, of of C state information tape you know, entries, and and that's what ACPI sort of has today. ACPI defines them at a processor level, but so we define them at each level in the topology. Um, and ACPI already has the fields in red. So it's got a register, which is kind of like a magic uh, a magic thing that when you read will put you into the power state. And I'll go into that as well later, because there's a tie into PSCI. It's the ones in black, right? Sorry, did I say the ones in red? Yes. The ones in black are the ones that are there. The ones in red are the ones that I think would be worth adding on top. Right. And uh, and it's, it has got a latency, so it has got that that is its cost, and that latency is, I think, it's described as the latency of entry and exit into the state. Well, it, yeah, and it's a, yeah, it's, so a, maximum it's a measure of time as well. So. Yeah, but there's no uh, concept of target residency like you have in CPU idle. There's no kind of break-even cost. Or 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 cash flush and cash restore, those sorts of things are just not. Yeah, not you don't know what you. What you're going to lose. Yeah, those uh, are difficult to categorize. Right. So, so what, what, one of the things that's come out a lot. So, so you know, Linux has got uh, target residency. Other other OSs do basically the same thing. Um, actually, to, to, to kind of make the ACPI tables work, I noticed that the ACPI uh, processor idle driver to, to define the target residency, it just takes the latency multiplies it by two. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's not ideal. So, so, so I added a break-even, but, but the, 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 one of the problems with the break-even, and we interested to see what people think, is that what one of the points has been made is that actually, um, really, the latency, uh, well, or the amount of time that you're going to be in a given state before it starts to save your power is going to also be driven by internet latencies, and those are mm -hmm. actually driven by primarily how dirty your cache is and what operating point you're running on. So it's actually a dynamic piece of information. Yes. But the challenge would be if it's a dynamic piece of information, how you could represent that. And uh, and I just I scratched my head and I couldn't find an erase-free, easy way of doing this. Yes. So I'm kind of the, going for maximum. The, but it'd be the, interesting to see what the, people The other think. way to do that is to not try to put that into into ACPI, you know, give us enough information that we can make the system work, and rely on uh, device drivers for mm. particular classes of system. I mean, we don't have to get everything into ACPI. We can do. We certainly want to have enough to get to a functional system, but for a specific hardware support, I have no problem with uh, doing device drivers. 
Right, so the idea would be that you have fairly good behavior, but if you go and get your optimized device driver for your platform, you get excellent behavior. Well, you get so, the recent Linux kernel, which hasn't been already in it, and yes. Right. Yes. And everyone else, yeah, they have to get device drivers. Well, I'm thinking but that's, that this is for the CPU, though. I think coming up with something that's somewhat generic would make sense, because then the kernel could do some level of general common sense stuff without requiring uh, uh, vendor-specific drivers. Yeah, ha ha having some basic information. But right. I, I guess my point is, is we don't have to have absolutely perfect information going through ACPI. ACPI can be the fallback if there isn't better information from a SOC-specific or a system-specific driver. So would you agree that having at least a little more than just a... Oh, yeah, no, no, I, I'm not saying don't do, do that. Yeah. I'm just tempering it with... It, it, this doesn't have to be perfect. Right, right. I mean, one of, one of the very I, it, simple it, I ways... I mean, this would still be a, a, you know, a vast improvement on what's there today. Yes, yes. yes. But, and another way that, that I've been kind of thinking about too is, is um, just having it be a relative value. You as the SOC vendor tell it, I define what that is. Um, I, all I know is that X is bigger than Y, and I can make a decision based on that. You know, you you tell me what the magnitude is. We'll we'll need the scheduler guys yeah, to yeah. actually uh, give some information on whether. Uh, relative values would be useful to them. I mean, right. Th they've already got all kinds of problems that they've got to figure out anyway with what to do about CPU power management. And well, that all well, and so that's kind of why I wanted to find out if, if, if Ingo had a list of these are the things that I would like to see in the scheduler. Yeah. It's, it's very effective by, by the policy decisions. Yeah. yeah. So you're going to be very affected by the policy decisions if you can define these in somewhat absolute terms, even something as ambiguous as, as the break-even or, or target uh, residency, yeah. um, you still have the effect of, of the decisions made in the kernel about, I'm interested in not conserving power. I, I want to keep my performance very high. I don't care about power. Yeah. And, oh, and the reverse. Still have, I, yeah. I don't care if I impact right. performance right. severely, yeah. but I need really low power. Yeah. I, and, and you still have all the mechanisms that let it play. And actually, to be honest, this, you know, just pretty much brings it in line with what you have in the kernel today. This break even is equals equals target residency. Right? A typical CPU idle driver today just has that. OK, uh, so there's a few other bits that I um, thought it was worth adding. Um, and maybe it's worth just going through each one in turn. Um, so one of them is uh, this idea of generic state flags. And uh, there's basically three flags. And I'll go into how the cache would be represented in a minute. In fact, I'll go straight after this. Uh, and then we can come back. Uh, but one of them is to say um, you actually have to manage cache in the OS. If you actually use PSCI, that wouldn't be true. The caches would be managed for you on entry and exit to states. Um, but you know, although I have a, quite a strong interest in PSCI, you know, I acknowledge that might not have it. So, you know, that's the flag for that. Uh, cache contents are lost. It's just to tell you that some of the caches are going to be blown away by the state, because they could be blown away for you by the hardware or by the hardware, <coughs> uh, if you were going to Firegate the state. And then platform coordinated is basically, um, it's basically, if the flag is set, the idea is that whatever power state you ask for, that's exactly what you will get. So if a CPU asks for cluster down, the cluster would go down, regardless of what the other CPU is doing. Because what we're basically saying is the OS has to coordinate all of this. If um, if it's clear, then the idea is that the firmware coordinates for you. And when both CPUs ask for cluster down, the cluster goes down. So you can basically operate on each uh, CPU completely independently. So, so the, the idea here is if that flag is set, then there's a, an MP, MCPM style state machine in the kernel. Right. Actually, I said it the wrong way around. It would be clear. But yes, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I should have called it. <laughs> Style. That's the key word. Right? Just want to say that, well, you need to coordinate CPU and, well, you need to do coordinate CPU in PSCI too. I mean, coordination. Yeah, yeah, no, but, but that's the whole thing. Basically, it's telling me, do I have something in the firmware that's going to coordinate for me? Or, uh, or don't I? If, if I do, then the semantic of your power requests are going to be 
I'll go for the highest fire state possible and I might not get that but if everybody asks for that then we will get it because the coordination will be done for us. Whereas if um, in the opposite case um, then the OS would, you know, because you're not getting that coordination, each CPU would ask for, you know, if it wasn't the last CPU, it wouldn't ask for the cluster state because uh, that would kill the whole cluster regardless of what the other CPUs are doing. So there'd be a, some coordination there. See? That's, that's the idea. So, so if you have multiple levels of cash flow, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> this, is, this is how Grant gets his exercise. Yeah. That's, that's how he keeps so thin, you know? So if you, do have, <laughs> so if you do have multiple la layers of cache, then you define uh, one module per layer, even if it's within one module CPU. Well, what, like my suggestion on how to do cache would be that, again, we use the hierarchy, mm. and, and, and we introduce a new object that just describes what cache level is present at each layer. And so if we had you know, a system like this, um, I keep going the wrong way. So we've got a cluster here. It's got CPU 0, CPU 1. They've both got an L1. And, and the cluster's got an L2. Then in, in the very same hierarchy that we've already established, I can say I can I define which caches are private to that particular level of the hierarchy, which means that I could have any arbitrary number of caches on this particular CPU. Uh, you know, it, it wouldn't matter. And actually, although I'm just notionally, as for example, sakes, just describing the level that I'm worried about. In, in theory, you could actually describe a lot of properties about the cache here, and you'd be saying this CPU has got these caches with these properties, right? Um, and you could do and you can do that at every at every level. So you could have very, very heterogeneous caching and again it'd be completely describable. So, so if you were if you did have two layers of cache on that one CPU block and you had various states within, you would define them as a how would you define it with the well, C state? Well I think I think in that process? case what you would do is that the cluster one would be called an L three. And one CPU would have L one L two and the other one would have L one if it was that kind of heterogeneous. Right. So you you would have to have unique Labels for each cache, otherwise it's not going to. Or for each level of cache, otherwise it's not going to work. Yeah. You probably got CPU one down there, didn't you? Yeah. This is what happens when you do slides at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yes. Um, and then the, the idea with how it would then play into play with the flags is that the. You know, when when if you want to just use the cache information to know about effectively performance cost, performance loss, the, the cache's contents lost flag is telling you that. And it's telling you that, you know, if 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 only one of these processes has gone in, you know, CPU 0 or CPU 1, sorry, for the typo, had gone into uh, the cluster state, um, then you'd know that you've lost one of those R1s. But as soon as, um, you know, as soon as all the CPU is going in, then you'd know that you've lost the L1s and the L2s. Right, so, so they tell you. And equally, the OSPM managed cache flag, there the, the information would be slightly different. It would be telling you, well, if only one of the CPUs has gone in, you've got to manage its L1. But as soon as the second CPU goes in, you've got to manage the L1 and the L2. Yeah. It's, it's just, telling just, you. Just as a sanity check, and I'm going to pick on Nico here. Uh, I should walk over so I can hand the mic. Um, how does, well does this line up with... Uh, what we're already having to do for power management when we do uh, MCPM. I'm sorry, I didn't follow the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a bunch of um, states with uh, the CPUs on, um, or a bunch of properties in the in the data. Uh, Charles, do you want to quickly re repeat the, the so, states, so, that, so, the so, flags that you're putting so, in? Okay, so, so, so the idea is that we have a, a hierarchical tree representing the the power states and the associated caches uh, with the hierarchy in the tree. So I can say, um, for any given CPU, what caches are private to that CPU and what states are private to that CPU. And then at the next level up in the hierarchy, so the cluster level, I'd be describing which caches are private to the uh, cluster and um, which power states are private to the cluster. So unlike a TC2 system, uh, I would describe nothing at the CPUs other than the cache because um, there is no power gating for core. 
and at the cluster level, let's say I've got a I've got a cluster power state, and I've got an L2 cache as well. So the SPN knows that if only one of the CPUs in there has gone in into has requested a a power state like this, it would have lost only that cause cache, and it's or had to clean that cause cache if it's managing it. And when both CPUs go in, it would know that it's lost them both. Actually, I'd say it's a bit more complicated than that. In the TC2 example, you actually wouldn't lose caches until um, until all of them go in. I, I guess what my question is, is does what you've got up on the slides here match what we had to do to, <coughs> to make things work in a, uh, when we do it all within the kernel? So in the case where it's platform controlled, is this the right set of data, and is it described in the right way? Right now, uh, with MCPM right now, we already flush the right level of cache, whether or not we're shutting down this cl the cluster only one CPU. So it's, it's only based on whether or not you're the last man standing or not. It's, it's exactly the same information. Uh, I'd be very, very surprised if, this, if it isn't. But more than happy, I think, you guys take a look at it and, and, and give me your feedback. But it, and it's the same with which side of the firmware boundary you do it, to be honest. And, and this basically tells you what a non-last man has to do and what a last man has to do. This is only relevant if you have your, if the cache maintenance has to be done by the, by software. I mean, if you would have, imagine you would have a, system which can trigger an L2 write back and flush mm -hmm. in hardware. But then and the flags wouldn't be clear, would it be set for that power state? Okay, so you only need to set the flag when software has to do something. Right. The well, there, there are two flags. One is you're going to lose this cache, uh, but you don't necessarily have to do anything about it, which would be appropriate in the case that you're describing. Uh, or appropriate in the PSCI case as well, because the PSCI does the cache management for you. And the other flag would be more for, you know, if, if you're going to do it from the kernel, it's telling you, you have to manage these caches. He probably doesn't need one. Naive question for a twisted future world where, let's say, you've got a GPU sharing casters with the CPUs. <laughs> uh, any any considerations here for that? Uh, I mean, do we have to worry? I guess really is the question. Yes. Uh, it's a good point. I mean, <laughs> good the, no, we do have to worry definitely. Um, mm. that, well, if if no, no, you could in theory. I don't see why you couldn't have a device that is a GPU. And that GPU could also have one of these cache objects, and it could sit in the hierarchy wherever there is a, a shared cache at the next level, potentially. Uh, I think it is possible. But the, the one thing that I haven't got my head around, and I, it must be interesting, is it, could there be a situation where the, which hopefully couldn't exist, but where where um, where the power domain structure is completely incompatible with the cache domain structure. That actually is worth investigating yeah. before we... Because that's a big a, assumption here. Yeah, that's a very yeah. big assumption. Yeah. Hmm. You know, so for an example that you cited, if I had a system level pad, would I have a system level pad domain where this L3 cache lives that encompasses a GPU and a CPU? Um, hopefully. No, but if we start thinking about a cache, as, ouch, uh, a cache is a device, right? And one of the things we can do with an ACPI is define power domains and the devices that sit within those domains. There's, there's probably a way to describe it. Um, there's obviously nothing on the other side to do anything with the information yet, but it, I think it's I think it's describable today. Yeah, actually thinking about it, it doesn't necessarily have to. All, all we're doing is describing the caches that you might lose right. or you might have to manage. So I, I think that, I don't know, I think it still works. But yeah, yeah but, but it's one of the areas that I'm kind of worrying and worrying about. 
is this problem solved on a PC, x86? Here you go. AO3. Good so, question. Yeah. Tim? I don't think they are software maintenance. <laughs> I'll today. pull you out here again. Let's give this a tradition that connects. Um, so this, the separation of the cache from the CPU uh, clusters like this doesn't doesn't normally happen. It's done. It, the, the synchronization is all done in hardware. Yeah, that's the thing. Because actually, one of the things I, I, I tried to look for this in yes. the spec, and I couldn't find an, an equivalent. You know, and and I, and I think well, maybe I haven't seen it in the 900 plus pages, but which is more than possible. But uh, it's it's um, you know. I kind of surprised me that there isn't a description of the cache topology of the system in, in because the Because it's all handled for usually for right. you in those exactly. systems, right? The other thing you have here too, by the way, is the module devices normally can't have a CSX or a CLV inside them because you you determine which reserve. No, but this this is ACPI next. Right? Yeah, okay. So, so you, no, you can create yeah, you can create a new a new object with a new HID to the the contend mm -hmm. take CSX and CLV, sure. Yeah. But using the existing one, the existing module object. It would probably but, that, not yeah. work. Okay. but this is all about how right. do we is how do we change it? How do we know how the ICPI but first cache RFE described via CPU ID bits. Yeah. On X eighty six. Okay. Oh 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 I see what you're saying. Oh that's not not through ICPI. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. I'm X eighty six, it's under SARS. It's very hard to find and it's cache specific. Sorry? The cache specific information is defined in model specific registers. Right. Yeah. Processor architecturally defined. Uh, and some register. of that happens in ARM as well, actually. But, yeah. is, is, are those registers standardized at all? No. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but I mean, even even just by you know mutual agreement, uh, it, it's uh, they're all just different, uh, I would assume. The CPU driver is normally no standard. Okay. Okay. Um, so some of the other problems that we're trying to solve. Actually, we're quite quickly running on the time, but so basically, what's going to happen that once you put all this in place, next to the six will leverage this. Is that the only option? We hope so. Well, in some ways, you know. The way it's going to work, we're going to need for them to agree. Otherwise, we won't be able to put it in. But I was saying this is not our specific concern. No. no. Well, it, it, it does go back to the option of put it in the OS. <laughs> you know what the platform is, and therefore you know information about how to drive this particular platform. <laughs> Okay. Uh, what other stuff? Uh, what, what, the, the other thing that I haven't this this was would also be leveraged by Intel, but perhaps, but probably not. But they might be able to use it in some way. It's, it's an idea of architectural specific flags. So I'd be able to have flags to tell me what, uh, save in, in for ARM, those flags would tell me what I need to save and restore uh, when I'm using that pan state. Um, but those flags would be interpreted depending on the on the CPU architecture that you're running on. So Intel might want to use them for whatever, um, yeah, but but that's that's the idea that they're specific, and that would tell me, you know, that would tell me, I'd be able to do a generic driver that, you know, can. I can send you the slides, don't I? Um, and that 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 would be how I'd represent that, which is another big gap. And then yeah. The, the only, the, well, the other, the other big problem that ACPI doesn't represent is um, dependencies between uh, devices and C states, or power resources in C states, or even interrupts in C states. So it's got this notion that an interrupt can wake you from any power state, but actually in ARM I might have a power state where I've knocked out the gig, and only the few interrupts that I've also wired off to my power controller can wake me up from that state. So, so I have this notion of a, of a depth, of Depth, which is basically replacing the, the index that I've now kind of lost by doing the hierarchy thing. And then when I define an interrupt, I can say, well, this interrupt can wake up from this depth or lower. Right? 
So, so uh, you know, a gig, uh, a power state that knocks out the gig would be the highest depth in the system, and only a few interrupts would go to that depth. And and also the very same concept can be used to say, if this device is active, um, then these power states are no longer on the table. So you can represent those sort of events. It's one o'clock. Sorry. Yeah. Lunch. <laughs> Anyways, hope that was useful. Uh, if anybody's got feedback, please let me know. We want to make this work as best as possible. So, thanks a lot. Tim over here. Uh, we need to have a conversation with this afternoon. Okay. I just want to clarify some of our misunderstandings about ACPI because he's Yes, yes.